On to our event of the day. I think Tony Tyler needs very little introduction in this room as the former CEO of Cathay Pacific, a member of the FCC and a longtime Hong Kong resident. I'm sort of wondering how he's finding living in Canada and Switzerland compared to the cut and thrust of Hong Kong. I think you left about four years ago today. Um, Tony is now the CEO of IATA, uh, which today just put out a fresh report on the airline industry and safety records. Today he's going to speak about the state of the airline industry, as well as perhaps some talk about Hong Kong and the prospects for a third runway. It's my pleasure to ask Tony Tyler to come and speak. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Tara. And I must say, it is, uh, it's great to be back in Hong Kong um, for a few days. Um, as you said, it's, uh, it's almost exactly four years since I left Hong Kong, probably about four years to the day that I last stood here and, and addressed the, uh, the Foreign, Cor Cor Foreign Correspondents Club. Um, as you say, I am a, a member of the Foreign Correspondents Club. Um, and this is my membership card. And I'm pleased to say it's still in one piece. Um, it's, it's great to be back, um, and, and I, you know, I thoroughly enjoy the opportunity to, to, to see the world from a, a different place, um, but I have to admit Hong Kong still feels very much like home, and it's really a great pleasure to see so many familiar faces uh, here, here today. And I did want to share with you some thoughts on the industry as a whole um, before focusing on some key decisions on aviation uh, here in Hong Kong. And the first point to, to, to raise is that this does look like being a relatively good year for the um, airline industry. And we're estimating that airlines will make a net profit this year of about $25 billion. And that may sound like a lot. By the way, when I, I'm, or, uh, these are US dollars I'll be talking today, uh, just to make sure you're um, clear about that. Uh, it may sound like a lot, but, but um, to put it into perspective, let's remember that, that Apple, single company, made $18 billion in the first quarter of this year. And that was on revenue of $74 billion, while the whole airline industry will make $25 billion on revenues of $783 billion, which is a net profit margin of 3.2%. So put it another way, airlines on average will keep about $7 this year for every pass profit for every passenger carrier. But I'm not trying to sell you a sob story. The industry's fortunes are improving, and on average, this year we expect to see a return on invested capital of about 7%, which is nearly recovering the industry's cost of capital. And certainly the fall in the oil price is helping, but perhaps not to the extent you might expect, because even as a lot of airlines' forward hedges come off, the strength of the US dollar is going to limit the impact of the price reduction. And of course, many airlines will face higher costs in areas as widespread as aircraft acquisition, maintenance, catering, and so on, uh, from that strong dollar. So my conclusion is that this year is going to be a good one, but like most years in the airline industry, it's still going to be a tough battle for airlines to keep their revenues ahead of their costs. Now, aviation is, of course, a business, and making a profit is crucially important. But for airlines, safety really has no competition as the industry's top priority. And this week is a particularly poignant one uh, for, for the industry because, as you know, it's been a year and a day since MH370 went missing. And the aircraft is still not being recovered, and we're no closer to understanding what happened than we were a year ago. MH370 is a, a tragic mystery. And in this sad anniversary week, our thoughts and prayers, of course, are with the families and friends of the 239 missing souls that were on board. And as they are indeed with all who've lost their lives in aviation accidents. And of course, here in Asia, the shooting down of MH17, the two TransAsia accidents, and AirAsia 8501 are also, of course, also uh, top of mind. And the greatest respect we can pay to all those involved is constantly to improve the safety of flight. And IATA plays a significant role in aviation safety. The IATA Operational Safety Audit, for example, is the global standard on how airlines manage safety. And it's a requirement for all the 251 
um, IATA member airlines, and in fact, another 150 or so non-IATA members have also successfully met the 900 plus um, safety standards that that, that in, it involves to join the IOSA registry. And we're also building a massive database that will help us to focus our future safety initiatives, and we call this GADM, the Global Aviation Data Management. And already some 470 different sources are contributing data, and the vision is to develop and then improve analytical tools and systems uh, that will help prevent future accidents. But the most fundamental data on safety performance is that of accidents, and today we announced data on the industry's performance in 2014. Several high-profile tragedies kept aviation safety in the, in the headlines um, during the year. And in 2014, there were approximately 38 million flights and 12 uh, safety-related accidents with fatalities, nine with turboprops and three with jets. And I want to be clear about these three jets. They were MH370, AirAsia Indonesia 8501, and Air Algerie 5017. MH17 isn't included in these statistics because that was an outrage and a tragedy, but like the aircraft involved in 9-11 some years ago, it wasn't an accident, it was the victim of an act of aggression. Now, we released a lot of numbers on safety this morning, and I encourage you, particularly the, the working press among you, to have a look at the press release. And you'll see an overall trend of improvement by almost every measure over the past five years. For example, the jet hull loss rate was the lowest in history, with one for every 4.4 million flights. And sadly, the one parameter that did take a step back was fatalities. There were 641 in 2014, which is above the five-year average of 517. And the three jet aircraft that were lost last year were in catastrophic circumstances with no survivors. And as an industry, you know, we feel for each and every one of the victims and their families. And our goal, of course, always is to have no fatalities. And considering that 3.3 billion people flew in 2014, flying is the safest way to travel. Now, in recent months, we've seen questions asked about aviation safety in Asia. And there were no jet hull losses in China last year. And in Asia, um, ex-China, there was one jet hull loss for every 2.3 million flights in 2014, which is an improvement on the one in 1.6 million five-year average. Now, it's below the average industry performance, but it would be a mistake to think that flying in Asia is unsafe. But it would also be naive to say there were no issues at all. And later this week, I'm going to Indonesia, and I'll be discussing with the government there how we can ensure that capacity in the infrastructure and the regulatory framework is able to meet rapidly growing demand. And in a way, it's a similar story to what we saw in China some time ago. Um, and we're going to be working hard to ensure a similar successful outcome. But my main message on safety today is that despite aviation safety being in the headlines through much of 2014, flying is safe. And even more importantly, we're working to make it even safer. And on that note, I'd just like to update you on two other areas. The first is aircraft tracking. And I think it's no understatement to say that we were all shocked um, that a large commercial airliner, MH370, could go missing. Well, last month at um, ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, at their second um, high-level safety conference, the issue of tracking was a top agenda item. And governments are now working with industry on a, on a standard for tracking that will be implemented progressively. And the first step is a series of operational initiatives that will lead us to a standard for position reporting every 15 minutes. And the plan is for that to take effect next year. And we're also all looking to space-based technology that has tremendous potential to make the system even more robust uh, in the next few years. And the other agenda highlight from the ICAO Safety Conference was on overflying conflict zones. Now, airlines need authoritative, accurate, consistent, and unequivocal information on which to make decisions about where to route their aircraft. And ICAO is now leading an initiative to enhance the information that's available. And of course, IATA is giving that initiative its full support. And we're also working with ICAO to close a gap 
in the international oversight of weapons with anti-aircraft capability. Uh, when you think about it, th there are international conventions controlling many types of weaponry, chemical, landmines, uh, nuclear, and so on. But MH17 clearly displayed the need for similar controls on the design, manufacture, and deployment of weapons that are capable of bringing down aircraft. And our agreeing an in international convention, I think, it will take time. But I'm confident that working with ICAO, we can move that forward successfully. And now I'd like to turn my attention from, from safety to Hong Kong and some of the key decisions um, that, that will be made soon on the future of aviation here. Now, I don't need to tell you, Hong Kong is a very special place. It, it's unique in the world. It's unique in China. And it brings together the best of the best, whether it's financial expertise, fashion, food, culture, you know, you name it, it can probably be found here, and it can be found to a very high standard. And that couldn't happen without the connectivity that's provided by a truly great airport. And I think Hong Kong can and should be rightly proud of the important role that this city plays in the global air transport system. The Hong Kong airport is, if you like, a centerpiece of a, of a powerful ecosystem that includes the port, you know, the can-do spirit that Hong Kongers share, the history of bridging east and west. And the airport is a community asset, and it helps to define this very special and successful place. It's the 10th busiest airport in the world in terms of international passengers, and it ranks first in cargo. Hong Kong punches well above its weight in the global air transport industry. And we should recognize a couple of things about this. First of all, that playing this leadership role isn't an act of charity. The Hong Kong economy benefits greatly from it. But also, it's a fragile position. And there is intense competition to go connectivity in other places, too. But the connectivity that's generated at the airport is part of a, of a package of attributes that's attracted some 3,500 corporate head, uh, regional headquarters to set up here, directly employing 140,000 people. And of course, aviation is the core enabler of much of Hong Kong's tourism industry, which brings $250 billion of business, Hong Kong dollars of business. And we did a study to quantify the impact of the aviation and aviation-related tourism sector on Hong Kong, and we found that it supports some 8.2% of Hong Kong's GDP. So it's absolutely in Hong Kong's best interest to see the aviation industry here flourish. And that was clearly behind the, 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 behind the thinking that led to the development of Hong Kong International Airport in the first place. And that has proved to be a really wise investment from day one. But the secret is out. Governments in this part of the world and, of course, the Middle East are building very impressive infrastructure to grab bigger pieces of the growing pie. And from the global industry perspective, that's great. But from the perspective of Hong Kong, it means competition for hub traffic. And we've studied developments in a few key passenger flows to see how Hong Kong was doing. Well, between 2005 and 2013, Hong Kong's share of the market connecting China to the rest of the world shrank from 20% to 17%. It stagnated with a 10% market share on the ASEAN to North America market. And its 3.3% of ASEAN to Europe traffic has gone down to 2.4%. Now, there are lots of reasons why these changes are happening. The Middle East airlines are proving to be very strong competitors with very efficient and very affordable hubs. And that's a central part of their success. And the other hubs in this region are continuously upping their games as well. Singapore's just confirmed 3 billion Singapore dollars, about 17 billion Hong Kong, for a fifth passenger terminal after building a third runway that will eventually be open for commercial use. Incheon Airport in Seoul will open a new terminal by 2017. Bangkok's expanding. And there are plenty of airports in Hong Kong's backyard, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Macau, of course, also eager for traffic. And then, of course, there's a frenetic expansion of airport infrastructure that's taking place really right across mainland China. So the announcement last week by the financial secretary in his budget speech that the third runway will be built by 2023 should be greeted by everyone in Hong Kong as very encouraging news. Now, IATA has long been an advocate uh, of the need for a third runway, 
and we were particularly involved in the environmental impact assessment, recognising that whatever is built must be sustainable. And the government, the Hong Kong Airport Authority, and everyone associated with the project, I think should be commended for the thorough work they've done on evaluating the environmental impacts and working out how best to mitigate them. But the goal is to reap the economic and social benefits of connectivity by sustainably meeting the growing demand. And already, Hong Kong's success is, is really nothing short of phenomenal. Um, serving some 63 million passengers a year, nearly 4.4 million tons of cargo, um, and an increasing capacity to serve 100 million passengers and 9 million tons of cargo by 2030, this will no doubt prove to be a, a, a pillar of Hong Kong's continuing success, providing, of course, it's built and funded wisely. And I'd like to share with you some thoughts on both those issues, funding and construction. And to start with, I do hope that the new facilities at the airport will continue to be built in close consultation with the airport's main users, the airlines. And the close collaboration that's developed over the years between the airlines and the airport has demonstrated its value in supporting the airport's success. But moving from a two-runway operation to a three-runway uh, uh, service is complex. And the master plan for the airports clearly established and, and very well supported by the airlines. But the devil may be in the details here. Developing a satellite terminal, reconfiguring, in some cases even demolishing existing infrastructure, it needs to be done in a way to enhance the airport's efficiency and competitiveness. And it would be a great shame, for example, if the expansion in capacity resulted in a, a big increase in the minimum connecting time. So the airlines are eager to be strong partners in developing the future of Hong Kong International Airport. And we look forward to continuing the transparent engagement with the airport authority to make sure that the future development is focused on enhancing the airport's efficiency and strengthening Hong Kong's overall competitiveness. And the other element of success is how the, um, the expansion's financed and funded. And there have been many discussions about the funding model for the infrastructure, and I'd like to provide some thoughts on how the airline community sees this. And first of all, let me be absolutely clear. We accept and support, indeed, the user pays principle. This is a principle that's well established all around the world. Airlines, through their airport charges, pay for the infrastructure that they use. And in fact, there are even some globally agreed principles on how infrastructure should be funded. And key among the ICAO principles for, for airport development are that users must be consulted and that they shouldn't have to pay for the new facilities until they're actually ready. Now, the first is self-explanatory and follows on from what I've been saying about operational cons uh, consultation. Airlines and airports are partners. We both benefit when we sit down and agree on the best way forward, both in the way the airport's built and how it's paid for. And the second thing I mentioned, the avoidance of advance payments, is also a common sense approach for large infrastructure projects, particularly when there are well-developed capital markets and the commercial success of the infrastructure is proven. And as I said, airlines accept the user pay principle, but they should only start paying when there's something to use. I mean, you can't charge a toll for a bridge that isn't yet built or a tunnel that is yet to open and the same is true for airport infrastructure. Once the airlines are using all the new infrastructure, of course, we'll be happy to pay for it. And how much we have to pay will depend on the circumstances at the time. But of course, by then, we will know for sure what it's cost and we'll also know what the traffic volumes are. And this is an important point. So I want to explain our concerns a bit further. Starting to pay for the cost of the third runway in advance would mean increasing current airport charges. And this isn't, isn't only wrong in principle, but it would be unfair. Airlines and passengers using the airport today will be paying for those who are going to use it tomorrow. And most importantly for Hong Kong, it would be taking risks with a business model that's been proven to work very well. Since the airport opened in 1988, Hong, Kong, Hong Kong's airport charges have become very competitive. And as a result, airlines have wanted to come here and the airlines already here, particularly the ones based here, have added enormous frequency and capacity. Now, as an example, we did look at what a 10% increases in charges could do for the Hong Kong hub. Making the airport more expensive would weaken its competitiveness, reducing passenger numbers by up to 80,000 a year and cargo by up to 7,000 tons a year. And that would lower 
aviation's contribution to Hong Kong's GDP, and by the way, placed some 600 jobs in jeopardy. But let me emphasize, Hong Kong Airport is a huge success. It supports the Hong Kong economy, it delivers great service to customers, airlines, passengers, and it's, it's one of, if not the, most profitable airlines and uh, airports in the world. Why risk destroying something that works so well? So this begs the question, could a third runway be developed without increasing charges, without placing a burden on taxpayers, without making it more expensive for travellers, without adding an extra burden to shippers, and while increasing the hub's competitiveness? It's an ambitious undertaking, but I believe the answer is yes. The successful financial situation of the airport today can allow that to happen. Now, in their last financial year, 2013, 2014, um, the airport here had a pre-tax profit of 7.8 billion Hong Kong dollars, which is about half their revenues. And it has very little debt, just about 10% of its total capital. In fact, if it, if it wanted to, a Hong Kong airport could actually eliminate airport charges to the airlines entirely and still be profitable. But um, don't worry, I'm not suggesting that. But I will suggest that the airport could self-fund the investment needed for the third runway, with no increases in charges for existing facilities or for those that are being built. There's ample scope for the airport to finance the construction by borrowing the necessary $150 billion or so, Hong Kong dollars, for the runway through bonds or commercial loans. And here I want to be very clear on the user pays principle that the airlines support. We are not asking anybody else to foot the bill for our growth. Airlines pay user charges to the airport, and the current level of charges and the current business model would provide sufficient revenue to pay back the loan or whatever financing mechanism is chosen to fund infrastructure investment. Airlines would pay for the infrastructure through increased volumes, not increased charges. And as I said earlier, that includes for the existing facilities and the new construction. The growth in traffic that the extra runway and terminal will bring will see the airport's success over the last 17 years repeated all over again, providing, of course, its airport charges are kept competitive. It's a proven business model. So why risk changing it? Now, while the new facilities are being built, the airport's dividend to the government will reduce. But any normal business faces the same situation when it makes a major capital expenditure to support its future growth and its future success. But no legitimate return ever comes without some upfront investment. And let's not forget that the value of the airport to Hong Kong was never intended to be only in the profits it generates. In fact, its role as a catalyst for economic activity makes a much broader contribution to the community and to the government. You know, the airport's the proverbial goose that lays <coughs> golden eggs. And its success brings prosperity to Hong Kong. It needs to be nurtured. But changing its diet puts the golden eggs at risk. And it would be a great shame if they stopped. Well, look, as I said a few minutes ago, you know, Hong Kong's my chosen home. And I, I believe passionately in the future of Hong Kong and the critical role that air transport can continue to play in connecting this great city to the world, and in doing so, enriching it culturally and economically. I know it's a bit late to be wishing everybody gong hei fa choi, but I will anyway in a slightly special context, because I can't think of a better way to wish the 7.2 million people of Hong Kong gong hei fa choi, happiness and prosperity, than by encouraging decisions on fulfilling the airport's 2030 master plan with a firm focus on enhancing Hong Kong Airport's ability to contribute to Hong Kong's competitiveness. Now, very important decisions lie ahead. And I have every confidence that through transparent consultation, the right choices for the future are going to be made. Thank you very much. Tony, thanks very much. Uh, we have 15 minutes for Q&A, so please raise your hand, give us your name and organization, and we'll try to get to everyone. We'll start at this end of the room, right over here. Uh, Nigel Sharman, Solicitors. Is there I think there was someone right behind you who had raised their hands first, but I'll, I'll come to you next, I promise. Sorry, my name is Clementine. I'm a reporter with Bloomberg News. I've got a three-part question. The first um, is to just follow up on what you said you would be doing in Indonesia, the agenda. Um, could you just tell a little bit about who you'd be meeting and 
what is the agenda, uh, agenda over there. And um, for another question is on Indian Airlines. Um, recently, they just announced um, a policy on domestic flying credits. I just want your thoughts on how you think that may or may not help um, Indian Airlines domestically. The third question obviously has got to do with lithium-ion batteries that we found that we uh, found I out yesterday. I think it's fair to take one question, okay, given okay. we have a huge just, number just, just, of people. Okay, so fine. Let, 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 maybe the third question would be great if you could take that first. The lithium-ion batteries. It was found out that there was it didn't go on uh, security screening um, when it went on MH370. I just want your thoughts on that whether it would be a consequential kind of a reason. Thanks. So, Nate, choose one if you, if you can't get to all of this. Uh, well, I'll, I'll answer very, very, very quickly. Um, I'm, I'm in Indonesia, I'll be meeting uh, representatives of the government and also the industry there, the regulators, the airports, and, of course, uh, very importantly, uh, my, my member airlines. Um, watch the IATA webpage for further press releases on that subject. Um, the Indian carriers, I'm afraid, I'm not familiar with the domestic flight credit program, so I can't really answer that one. Lithium, um, lithium batteries, clearly a, a, an important safety um, issue for the industry, and one that uh, IATA is very engaged with, the, with ICAO um, on and with, the, with, our, with our member airlines and other partners. Um, I, I'm not aware of any particular um, MH370 implications here, but generally lithium batteries are a potential risk which have to be managed very carefully. <clears throat> and the IATA uh, dangerous goods um, regulations, do, do, which, which are derived from the regulations driven by ICAO, if followed, uh, make it safe to handle um, lithium, lithium batteries. The important thing, you know, is that governments enforce um, the correct declaration by shippers of what they're actually shipping. And that is, that is an area of risk. But providing they're handled properly, they're safe. The risk is people will cut corners. Thank you. We had a question traffic jam over there, so please go ahead. Yeah, just one from me, Nigel Sharman from Gaul. Um, is there any reason other than cost why you can't have real-time tracking of aircraft? An aircraft can go a long way in 15 minutes. Um, yes, at the moment, the moment that technology... Te there's, there's a lot of different technologies there, but there, there is no technology that can track every aircraft everywhere in the world all the time. And that technology may well be coming with what's called space-based ADSB. Um, and the, the, some satellites are being launched this year for the, to, to set up a, what will eventually be a completely global coverage network. It'll cover the poles, it'll cover all the oceans. And that may well be the, the, the solution in the end, but at the moment, um, it's, it's not simply a cost issue, it's a technology issue. And, and tracking aircraft where there are plenty of radars around or there's plenty of, 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 of uh, satellite coverage is, is relatively straightforward, but there are parts of the world where that isn't possible. But the industry is united in understanding it's got to do something to improve, improve its tracking capabilities. We have a question right here. <clears throat> behind you, behind you. Hi, David. Hello, David. <laughs> um, what's your input on uh, the latest spat between the Middle East and the American carriers and also Fifth Freedom Rights because while well, it's just in the U.S. last week, they keep, I think the Americans are just being over-assertive. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, this is a, an argument that's gone on for a long time. Um, on the one hand, um, uh, the Amer American, American and, uh, and indeed some other carriers believe the Middle East carriers are, are uh, uh, subsidized uh, by the governments. Um, the counter charge is that the Americans have benefited significantly from from um, Chapter 11 restructuring, which has enabled them effectively to, 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 to write off debt and to reduce their costs. Um, the argument, I'm confident, will, will rage for, for, forever. Uh, it will never be resolved. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, the nice thing is that uh, IATA has no position on this because we have members on all sides of the argument. And, and uh, what we do, we work in the space where airlines come together for mutual benefit to, to help improve safety to drive down industry cost where they can, to develop industry standards which enable the whole, oh, sorry, the whole interconnectivity um, of, of uh, air trans modern air transport. Uh, and in fact, uh, all, the, all the protagonists are busy shouting at each other at the moment in the media are all members of my board. And I'm looking forward to the next board meeting with some interest. <laughs> Sounds like fun. Um, over here, please. Thank you. Uh, George Russell from the uh, Institute of CPAs magazine. Um, just sort of scanning the headlines, there seems to be a, 
quite a few airlines, including in this region, uh, undergoing some kind of financial restructuring for various reasons. Thai, Malaysian, uh, AirAsia, SkyMark, Air India, and other areas like Air France and Norwegian. Um, is there a pattern? Is it an unusual number? Is Do restructurings work? Or do they point to some kind of bad fundamental somewhere in the, in the business? Uh, you said it. They point to some bad fundamentals in the business in the sense this is a very, very a, airlines is a, the airline industry is a very difficult industry. Um, it's fearsomely competitive because there are just so many airlines. I mean, as I say, we have, we have over 250 members. There's a whole lot of other, some quite big airlines who, who don't belong to IATA. We, we constitute some 84% of global air traffic. So it means there's another 16% who are not, don't belong to IATA. And there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's, there's literally a couple of thousand airlines, which is much more than you get in other, other industry where cross-border consolidation has taken place. That doesn't happen in this industry, industry so it becomes very, very, uh, very, very competitive. And as a result, um, margins are thin. And as I mentioned earlier, we know this year we may start to get close to generating our cost of capital as an industry. But that'll be the first year for many, if ever, that we've, we've got that close. It's just a very difficult business. And airlines, some airlines, sadly, sort of lurch from one crisis to the next. Um, and, but restructuring can make a big difference. And the, if you look at the US carriers who have undergone very painful restructuring, mainly using Chapter 11 um, um, mechanisms in recent years, they're now, they're now going very well. Um, other airlines who've got their act together in terms of restructuring their cost base, if they're, if they're also good at on the marketing side, have also, have also done well. Uh, but but you know, every... Every successful airline today has usually had to go through some pain in getting there. Um, because, as I used to tell my team at Cafe Pacific when times were good, you know, when, times are, when things are going well, enjoy it while it lasts, but don't get used to it. Uh, it's a tough business. Right over here. Uh, I don't understand it. Uh, it's, it's been re widely reported that the government or, air or airport authority is now considering imposing some sort of uh, departure tax or uh, airport construction tax um, as a way to fund the future airport, okay? Would you consider this as, uh, would be more acceptable because that would not affect directly the airlines, instead it would affect the passengers more, okay? Well, uh, as I said in my, um, in my prepared remarks, uh, I don't believe there's any need for um, the, for, for charges or whether it, charges to be raised or new charges to be imposed on users of the airport to, to, to fund the new development. I believe, I believe from the numbers that I've seen uh, that, that it should be, no, should be possible to, to develop the new facilities without having to do that. So um, you know, if, it, if it is necessary to do that, I think we all need to see the numbers and, and, and have, them, have the airport authority explain why it's necessary and then, then we, can, we can take it from there. But at the moment, I don't, I don't believe it should be necessary. Keith, you had a question? Yes, sir. Keith Bradshaw, New York Times. You talked about how on the tracking issue it's a question not simply of cost but of technology. But that said, it seems to move so slowly. Uh, and we get these episodic interests, expressions of interest, such as after the difficulty in finding, the initial difficulty in finding Air Asia. Would it be helpful for IATA to send some kind of a very clear deadline for picking a tracking technology, or will this de debate over the different space-based technologies and so forth go on for several years? Um, I, I don't think it is moving that, that, that slowly. I mean, really, you know, 12 months after the, um, after the disappearance of MH370, or within 12 months, ICAO had convened a conference. They, they, they had... Um, various task forces had, had met, discussed the issue, reported, and so on, and a clear direction was set. Um, I mean, these things, these things don't happen overnight, um, but it, it, nevertheless, it's, it's important to get it right rather than to, to um, rush for one particular technology. For example, you know, if, if, if um, you know, there's a debate going on, it's not quite the same issue, but a debate going on about what's called deployable um, flight data recorder. So, in other words, should should aircraft have some sort of flight data recorder that will, you know, if if, the, if it does go into the ocean, will uh, separate itself from the aircraft and float on the surface? That debate's going on at the same time. Debate's going on about uh, streaming flight data recorders. Now, if you're going to stream flight data, you certainly don't need a deployable flight data recorder. So let let's let's look at you know in a clearer light of day. Let's take our time to make sure we're we're backing the right horse, and then. 
make sure that that, that that really delivers. And I think that's the important, the important way. That's the way the industry has always developed. It's been successful in the past. Let's make sure we don't, um, you know, because of the pressures and the clamor to, uh, to produce an instant solution, let's make sure we don't get it wrong. So you don't think we need a deadline? The industry is working <laughs> faster. There is a, there's a deadline in terms of the, the, the new 50-minute tracking is, is designed to be in place by November next year. So that's very clear. That's what we're working to at the moment. Um, and, and as I say, I'm, I personally believe that the, when the space-based ADSB starts to be um, a reality, we, we, may see, um, we may see other ways of doing this, and they may give us, point us in a slightly different direction, but let's wait and see. We have a question back here. You had your hand raised. Uh, <laughs> wait for a microphone, and since it's here, we'll go ahead. Might be a very quick one. I'm Aaron Nigan of Aaron Nigan Associates Law Firm. Um, jet engines over the year have become more fuel efficient, but haven't got any faster. Is there any reason for this? So, so, what, um, so jet engines over the years have become more fuel efficient, but don't seem to have got much faster. Um, I'm not, I'm not a, a, a physicist or an engineer, but um, friends who are tell me that making aircraft fly supersonically, which is really the next boundary, if you like, is enormously expensive, um, and enorm enormously difficult technically, and therefore enormously expensive. Um, and the amount of for to generate the sort of forces you need to, to do that, you've got to burn a lot of fuel, and you've got to um, uh, have big, heavy engines which then burn more fuel. So, um, if you look at what the market wants, the market seems to say, you know, what flying along at about 550 miles an hour um, to get to get around the world and, and getting from you know a 16-hour flight from from Hong Kong to New York or whatever is probably is probably far enough and long enough that enough people will pay enough money to make that work. You start to make it much faster, it costs so much more that people aren't prepared to make it work. So I expect we'll stay with current speeds for the foreseeable future. We have a question back here, and then I'll come to the veranda. It's, it's a whirlwind in here today. It is. Yeah. Hi, uh, Danny Lee, South China Morning Post. Has uh, the airport authority or the Hong Kong government seen your proposals for the first time? Do you have any interest in lobbying the government on your own funding ideas for Hong Kong Airport's expansion. Uh, have you yeah, sure. I mean, we've, we've communicated our, our, our numbers and our thoughts to, uh, to the government and the airport authority, and they've, and they, they've, uh, they, they've listened very politely. Um, <laughs> and they have, uh, and, and, I, and we've, had, we've had discussions with them, and we're looking forward to further discussions and engagement with them, and they've, they've promised us that they will, of course, engage the airlines as, as users uh, in all the, in, in both the, um, in both the, the, the thinking about how exactly to, 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 to build and what, the facilities and what they should look like and how they should work, and of course the, the funding model, which is very important. Let's go to the veranda. Thanks. Hi, Suja, also from the South China Morning Post. Um, as you said, the airline industry does not have as much consolidation as other industries, and overall we've seen a lot of uh, opposition to uh, cross-border mergers and acquisitions, and here we have the, the local example of Jetstar Hong Kong. So uh, as the trade association, do you see protectionism at play, and do you think the industry as a whole would benefit from consolidation? Um, I think the, the industry certainly would benefit from, from consolidation. But cross-border consolidation is very difficult given the overall sort of structure of the industry and the underlying international legislation that, 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 that set it up some 71 years ago. Um, you know, when you have a situation which, under which, which starts off by saying that tra effectively traffic rights are sovereign, um, then you're, gonna have, you're giving yourself a, a, a rather difficult obstacle to overcome when it comes to ownership and control of airlines. Some very innovative models have, have, have come about to get over this, and uh, if you look at what's going on in, in South America, for instance, there's been some quite, um, quite sort of innovative ways of consolidating across national borders. Um, that we've seen here in Asia, if you like, of sort of international franchising of brands being another way to get around some of it. The, the emergence of alliances is, is a further way to, 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 to give the customer what they want, despite the fact you can't operate everywhere yourself. So I think you know, the, the, the industry is quite innovative and creative in finding ways around it. But that fundamental problem, uh, fundamental well, well, issue, I believe, 
is here to stay. Because if governments wanted to change it, they would. And, and although they, everybody talks about what a great thing it would be if it wasn't there, nobody ever does anything about it. So I assume it's because deep down people quite like it. Over on table number two, Mark. Thanks, Tony. I just want to follow on on uh, not so much Hong Kong, but you were talking earlier about expansion of airports and how that gets paid for and, and whether governments fund it if they really need to fund it, whether you, we believe in user pays, but to what extent and so on. Do you have, now that you're, you, have global, you have a global view, do you have some good examples from elsewhere around the world where this, is, this has worked pretty well, where governments have been able to find a compromise between between being able to finance it at the same time, not putting too heavy a burden on the on the users, both the uh, both the uh, flyers and the and the airlines. Yeah, uh, sadly, there are more bad examples than good. But I mean, there are some there are some there are some good examples. And, and look, I mean, Hong Kong itself, from from ninety eight to today, is a great example. But other airports in this region, I mean, airports like Incheon, airports like Singapore, um, you know, they they found a, a great a great balance of, of uh, you know, inv investing in the future and then making, you know, uh, providing great facilities which, air which airlines are then keen to use so they use in volumes enough to pay for it. And that's all we're, we're really saying that the model Hong Kong has followed. It works. So let's continue to use it. Table one over here. And then we'll have time for one Thank you very much. John Warham, I'm an independent uh, aviation author. Tony, I'd like to just um, uh, follow up on this business about aircraft tracking. Now, you've given us uh, reasons why there's the amount of delay there is and complexity of different systems. How do you reconcile all that to the statement uh, made by Representative Inmar Sat in May last year, prior to the ICAO conference, that with current technology they have in place now, um, they could implement it tomorrow and that they would be able to cover 95% of the uh, aircrafts uh, of the airline, um, mainstream airlines. So you're telling us, though, that this, the technology isn't there. In Mars, are saying they can implement it tomorrow. So there's a bit of dichotomy there. Could you explain that to us, please? Um, yes, and again, I'm not, a, I'm not a technical expert. John, you probably know a lot more about the technical side than I do. But um, in Mars, as you, as you say, it doesn't offer global coverage. And then some of the areas where it doesn't offer coverage are... Uh, are areas where, where uh, are really the areas that you're, you're concerned about because they, they offer coverage largely you know, where there are other um, technologies that, that, that currently work as well. There may well be that they're covering some, some blank spaces which, uh, which are not covered by anybody else. But I believe that, that it, it's important with new tech, other new technologies emerging and, and a competitor in Marsat is, is, is uh, um, Arion is, is planning to launch a lot of satellites which will uh, which will give full global coverage. I do think it's important that we, as I said earlier, that we back the right horse um, and that um, we, we, we make sure that it's something that is sustainable financially for, for airlines because this is, you know, this is an, it's a, a consideration you cannot ignore and one that, that will long-term do the job as well as it can. And, and others who are much better qualified than I to assess the technical um, advantages and disadvantages of various schemes are, are suggesting that we're not yet at the, at the point where we know for sure the right way to go. Francis, one more question. Yeah, um, Tony Francis Moriarty, freelance. Um, I guess my question just goes to the, the point of fairness. Um, Hong Kong taxpayers and, and who also fly are paying, you know, uh, fuel surcharges, they pay departure and landing taxes at different places. Um, if something is built, they'll be paying those those fees while it's being built. It's their taxpayer money being used. Uh, at the end of the day, they will probably face increased charges for using the airport that they helped pay for. I mean, it, why should they have to be putting up money at every single step while the airlines are arguing that they shouldn't have to put up money until they see what's built? Well, we, I don't think that um, when it comes to um, airport airport uh, costs for, for, for passengers, but I, do, I don't believe that they should have to pay before the, for, for anything other than the facility that they're using at the time. Um, and I think what I say, that the airlines are quite happy to pay. Indeed, the airport, airlines are currently paying for the current airport. When the new airport is built, the airlines will be 
will be happy to pay for that airport or for those facilities that are, that are, that are new. Um, and if that's considered that they should be shared, as it were, with passengers, or passengers should pay for them then, that's, that's a debate that should take place at the time, and it should be decided, well, who's going to pay how much? I mean, ultimately, if you like, passengers will pay for everything because it's the passenger revenue and, of course, the cargo revenue um, that pays for everything in the industry. That's where the money comes from, from ticket revenue and, and freight revenue. Um, so the issue really is, you know, how, how do we... How, what is the, the fairest way to extract the revenue from the passenger in a way that's clear w what's paying for what? Um, and I believe that uh, with the airport authority's strong financial position today um, and their ability to, to borrow and to, and to um, finance that borrowing and to service that borrowing, that it shouldn't be necessary for um, either passenger or airline to have increased user charges at the airport. Once the facilities are built, we'll know what it costs. Until then, we're working on estimates. Estimates will always have um, contingency built into them, so we'll be, you know, usually we'll be higher than we end up paying. Um, we'll also know what the traffic is, and until, until the airport is up and running with its full three runways, we'll be making estimates of what traffic will be, and again, those estimates are usually undercooked because we don't want to overestimate traffic and then find ourselves embarrassed that it's not there. So much better to, to, to finance the thing separately. Meanwhile, uh, certainly investment has to be put in in the, in the form of foregone dividends. But then the airport will be in a great position to generate good returns because they'll have, they'll have a strong traffic flow and a strong passenger flow. Tony, we're going to say thank you very much. It's gone 2 o'clock. We've certainly had a whirlwind of questions today. Uh, we have a small gift from the FCC, and we do hope you won't wait another four years before coming back <laughs> again. Thank you very much. Thank you.